over 115 hostages are held more than 300 days. Today, all of Israel, everybody in Israel are waiting for a counterattack from Iran and Hezbollah. There's great tension in our nation today. But in all that, how do Israelis keep on living after what happened in the 7th of October atrocities? Hi everyone, this is Erez Soref and we have with us here today Ela. Ela, so glad that you're here with us. It's an honor for us. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. And uh, Ela, we really want to hear a little bit of, of your story. Tell us, tell us about yourself. Um, I think when I tell about myself, I can say that uh, there's Ela of before October 7th and there's Ela after October 7th and uh, like I'm doing such, so much different things. Until October 7th, you know, I'm just a regular person. I'm a mother for, uh, of two sons, 12 and 16. I have a clinic of, of homeopathy medicine. I would do it for 17 years and I really love it. And you know, I just, you know, you just live the life and life is not perfect, but you just live your life like everybody. And then October 7th uh, comes and my family, uh, so it's really, really bad things happened to the to us to our family. My sister-in-law and her husband were murdered by Hamas terrorists. Uh, my two nephews, Michael and Amalia, Michael is nine and Amalia is six. They had to hide in the closet with their mother's body next to them inside of the house. And Abigail, this is the little sister. She was three years old. She was kidnapped by Hamas terrorists to Gaza and she she stood there for 51 days so life changed uh, and deep impact on everyone but your family it's really I mean it's super close to home I think it was a big hurricane for Israel for everybody mm -hmm. in well, Israel yeah. for you for me for everybody that's sitting here in the in the studio but I was really close I was like in the first um, line, yeah. line, and so I felt it stronger. But everybody felt the hurricane. It was a very bad one. And since October 7th, my life changed. So I'm doing different things. I'm working as a homeopath, but like 30%, 40% of my time. And all, all my other time is I, I dedicated for the hostages, for doing uh, humanitarian um and, you know, Activity, the activities, yeah. uh, diplomatic for the hostages. Uh, I give lectures. I take care. Um, I volunteer in hospitals to take care of soldiers that were injured in in the war with homeopathy, and it's, it's really amazing because they heal so quickly with homeopathy. So I do that. I do so many things uh, since because there are so much things to do now in Israel. So and and. How how was I mean besides the different allocation of time, how was it for your family? I mean your your husband, your two sons, for yourself. How did your family cope with this? With well, those it moves? was very hard. It was it it's still hard, because my husband, his sister was murdered, and it, she was his baby sister, and they were very connected. We're a very connected family. We used to visit in the kibbutz. Every Saturday. This is Kfar Aza. Kibbutz Kfar Aza. Which is like... Near Aza. <laughs> like literally <laughs> Literally the near, yeah. The, the fence of the kibbutz, is, you know, you can see Gaza, it's like 10 minutes on, uh, you can walk or you can take a bike for 10 minutes. So it's very close. That's why I never wanted to live there. Mm -hmm. I was the only member of the family that refused to live in the kibbutz because I was afraid of Gaza. It was too close, and I didn't like the view. <laughs> it wasn't a nice uh, sea view, so I didn't want to live there. Just too dangerous to raise my children. Yeah, fortunately proved that way. Yeah. And so, you know, all of this is happening October 7th. This Saturday was a traumatic for everybody, but obviously you have first-degree family in, in Kfar Aza, in the kibbutz. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about that and how life went on from there. Well, we woke up like everyone in Israel at 6.29 in the mm -hmm. morning from an alarm. There was a siren, a rocket siren, the bomb siren. Mm -hmm. 
so we have to run to shelter. We don't have shelter inside of the house, so we have to go down to two floors and then run across the field and then go down underneath the ground to the shelter. You have only 90 seconds oh. to reach until the bomb starts to fall. So we were terrified. We were totally terrified. We were not ready for that. It was Saturday morning. I was asleep. Everybody was asleep. You know, it was a holiday. So we ran to shelter. And you have to sit in shelter for 10 minutes until you're allowed to go out mm -hmm. because the bombs uh, can fall for 10 minutes. And where I live, there's a lot of uh, bombs. So we were, it was like a fire attack to, uh, to us. It was, so we were... It was very hard. And we, after 10 minutes, we went out of shelter. And then I heard on the news that also in the kibbutz, in Kfar Aza, there are also alarms. So I said, okay, I'll call my, my father-in-law, Eitan. He was alone that day at home because his wife, my mother-in-law, my, yeah, my mother-in-law, that's what you say. Mm -hmm. Shlomit, she was in Bulgaria. They took the elder people of the kibbutz to a trip in Bulgaria, like a, for a treat. They waited for this trip for like for a year. And Eitan could, could not go to the trip because he was not feeling good and he cannot walk. He was not healthy enough. So I knew Eitan is alone at home and I must call him because I knew he's like a bit grumpy that he didn't go to Bulgaria. I thought I'll call him to see he's okay and then I'll close down the phone and I'll go back to sleep. So I called Eitan that morning and he answered. It was like 6.40 in the morning. Eitan, how are you doing? Did you go to a shelter? Because he has one at home. And he said, yes, everything's okay. It's 6.30 uh, in the morning. Smadal, this is his uh, younger daughter. She called and told me, Daddy, go to shelter. There's, there's a siren because she was afraid he, he would not hear because he doesn't hear well. So I said, okay, so you're in the shelter room. Everything's okay. I really wanted him to say everything's okay. And I'll go back to sleep. And he said, yes, Ella, everything's okay. But Michael, this is Smadal's son, he's nine years old. He called me that mommy and daddy are lying down on the floor and they're not answering. And I didn't understand what he's saying because it sounds like he's not being coherent. I thought maybe he's going through something because Aiton usually he speaks. I understand, but what are they doing on the floor? I asked him, Aiton, what are they doing on the floor? Smadal is not doing yoga. I know she doesn't like yoga. So he said, I don't know. But Aiton, you told me that Michael told you that they're on the floor. What are they doing there? Why is she lying down? Everything's okay? Yes, Ella, everything's okay. And he put the phone down on me. And it was so strange because he never behaves like that. He's so um, polite and he's a quiet man. He would never put the phone down. After, you know, after a few days, he just told me he wanted to protect me. He didn't want to tell me what he heard. But I decided I'll call Smadal. I wanted to understand what is she doing on the floor? Is she doing a new mm, yoga or sense. something? Yeah. That, so I called Smadal's phone and she didn't answer. Her son, Michael, answered the phone. So I said, Michael. Michael, nine year old. She, he's nine years old. His sister, Amalia, she's six. And Abigail, we call her Guli. This is her nickname. She was three. So I called and, and Michael answered the phone. And Michael, can you please give me, I want to speak to mommy. You can't. Okay, Michael, so can I speak to daddy? You can't. I said, Michael, this is no time for joking. I want to speak to one of your parents. Please uh, give me one of your parents. I want to talk to them. And, he's, and he didn't answer. I said, Michael, what's going on? And then Amalia shouted, Ella, they killed mommy, and then they killed daddy, and they killed little Goli. Everybody's dead. <sighs> I said, what? What did I hear right now, Am Amalia? It's not funny. I really want to talk to one of your parents. So she repeated it. They killed everybody. They killed mommy and then they killed daddy and Guli's dead. Everybody's dead, Della. I said, oh, who killed? What, what are you talking about? And then she told me there was this terrorist that came inside of the house with a big gun and he shot mommy and then he shot daddy and Guli. And then my phone fell down. I, I was with, on the speaker because I was speaking to them and just dropped my phone and I, I catched my head like this and said, no, 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 it, it's not. It's, it's, I, I don't think. I told real. her, listen, Amalia, where are you? She told me we're hiding inside of a closet, inside of our room. Well, when they're hiding inside of the closet, they're not standing. They're inside of a shelf hiding like that. I told her, listen, don't go out of the closet. Stay inside and keep quiet. I'll call police. Everything is going to be okay. 
I promise you nobody's killed. Maybe mommy and daddy are injured. Maybe they fainted. Maybe they are losing a little bit of blood, but everything is going to be okay. I promise you. Just keep quiet and stay inside of the closet. I'm going to call the police, okay? She said, okay, and she closed the phone. I didn't want my children to hear this conversation because they were starting to, mommy, mommy, what's going on? Because they heard the phone down and I, I think maybe I screamed. I don't know. I don't remember. But they came in, mommy, what's going on? What's going on? Everything's okay. Tell them, everything's okay. Don't worry. I'm going to fix everything. Don't worry. I'm going to just call the police because maybe Smadar and Roi, her husband, are not feeling good and they need a little bit of help. So I'm going to help the children, please. Don't, no panic. And I went down to the field next to the shelter and I called the police. And I called the police. And I called and there was no police. Nobody answered. I think it was before 7 o'clock in the morning. I don't remember exactly the time. But there was no police. I, didn't, I thought to myself, what is going on? Ethan is not sounding, it doesn't sound like he's coherent, so, something is wrong, the children are telling me horrible stories, what is, and there's no police, am I in an anarchy, am I going to a chaos, what is, what is going on here, I said okay, there's no police, who am I going to call, I'll call the ambulance, I called the ambulance, usually they answer after right two away, seconds, yeah. they didn't answer me for like five minutes, seven minutes, maybe ten, But I was calling because I didn't know what to do. After, I think, a long time, I think it was like 10 minutes, they answered the phone and I told them, listen, you have to go to Kibbutz Kfar Aza. I need your help. The children are telling me the parents are killed. They're bleeding. You have to go. The baby is dead. Uh, please, the kids are hiding. Go and save the kids, please. Because I live an hour from the Kibbutz. And the lady on the ambulance on the phone told me, I'm very sorry. I know. I heard. There's a big, big problem inside of Kfaraza Kibbutz. It's a war zone right now and we cannot go in. I'm so sorry for you. And she closed the phone. And I remember that horrible moment that I understood there's nobody. Nobody can help me. It was like I was feeling so lonely. Like the loneliest person on earth. That's why I felt because I was standing inside in front in the field next to the shelter. And there's two children that need help and I cannot no police. There's no ambulance. It's a war zone and I don't have a weapon and I don't know how to use a weapon. I was in the army for 25 years ago and I didn't have a weapon. I used to teach soldiers about nature. <laughs> so I didn't know what to do. I remember standing in, in the field and I knew I have to make a decision inside of me. It was like a subconscious thought. I, I have, had to, to, to decide if I'm going to collapse or I have to fight for the children. I really wanted to throw myself on the ground and scream about what I heard on the phone. But I knew I can't. I could not do it because I saw my children from the window and they are again mommy what's going on what's going on why do you look like this why are you screaming why are you crying because I was walking back and forth back and forth walking I didn't know what to do and I saw my kids and I thought about Michael and Malia and I told myself I cannot collapse I have to be strong now and I have to save these kids I have to do that that's what I have to do I cannot let myself collapse I have to fight for them and with that thought I went back I went up home And I told my kids, listen, something really bad happened to the kibbutz, but everything's going to be okay. Everything, I promise you, I wanted my children to see that their mother can act, can do something when something really bad happens. I wanted them to know that they can trust me. They gave me a lot of strength just to look at them because I could not do anything else. And I was thinking about Michal and Amalia. I didn't know what to do. I sat, I sat next to the table in my living room and I was thinking, what can I do? What can I do? And then I thought, I need the army. I need the press. I need special units. I need police. But I don't have contacts to anyone. I didn't know what to do. So I went inside of the Facebook and I wrote a post. I wrote a post. I usually keep my account uh, private, but I opened it for public. I wrote, I'm begging you. I'm begging, I was begging for my friend, 
to everybody that mm-hmm. could hear. I got a call, my two nep- niece and nephew are in the kibbutz Kfar Aziz. They said the parents are killed and the baby is killed also. I need help. I need the army. I need special units. I need uh, the intelligent. Everybody, please, the press. Why the press? Because I remembered that they go inside a war zone. Mm. They put on the helmet and they run inside. So I said, they'll save the kids for me. So I need the news. They don't know what is going on. Nobody knew. There was nothing on the TV. So I made this post and I published it. And after one hour, it was viral. It was all over Israel. But what happened? Most of the people didn't know that something is really bad mm-hmm. happening inside of the kibbutz. So they thought I'm doing fake news. Right. I'm a drama queen. I, people thought I took drugs. So I was getting this terrible... Um, Messages. Yes, and they were cursing me and swearing. And, pub, and, and, you know, everyone was publishing my post and said, don't listen to her, she's crazy. And stop doing it. And they got to my phone, to my Instagram, to my WhatsApp. I was getting people told me, stop it, you crazy lady. You, everybody's panicking. All of Israel is panicking because of you. It was hard. But I decided I have, I'm on a mission. <laughs> I have to save the kids. I don't care. You can say whatever you want. I don't care. I, I ignored them. And after uh, more time, started to, people started to call me and tell me I'm from the army, I'm from here, I'm from there. And I started to make my own little unit. And I, I took uh, out of the Google Maps a photo of the house and I drew how to get to the house from the, from the kibbutz mm-hmm. and how to go from here. And I remember telling everybody, it's a black door, Idan family, near the pool, and the kids are in the yellow closet. Like I was sending people to, to save the children. But nobody came for hours because I thought there's only one or two or three terrorists right. walking around the kibbutz, but it was not. They were like hundreds, yeah, hundreds. maybe more, maybe thousands, I don't know. And they were killing people. And they were wearing army uniform. Army is I, Israeli army. Yeah, yeah, Israeli army uniform. Yeah. To mislead people. To yeah. mislead, knocking on the doors, telling them the army's here to save you, that people open the door and they were killed. So it was very, very hard. But through my post, my post was so viral, it got to Arab countries, it got to Iran, it got to Egypt, it got to Morocco, to Jordan, and I started to get pro-Palestine on my posts. It was horrible, with pictures of hostages, of dead soldiers, of videos and, and it was horrible what happened to my post. And people started to ask me, please take, take it care. off. Mm. We can't watch it. I told them, listen, the children are not saved yet. I need this post. I need people to see it that they can help me because it was hours and nobody came. I told people, so don't look. Don't look. I, I'm sorry. I'm not going to take it off. I'm, I'm not going to. I wanted the kids to be at home with us. I didn't want to take it off. And after a few hours, the post reached Australia to my Aunt Linda, wow. and she saw the post. I didn't tell her. And she sent it to another person, who is an American man, whose name was Peter Cash. He lives in America, but he was in a vacation in Dubai. And he saw the post, and he sent it to a woman named Hadas from uh, the other ambulance con- uh, company, Ichud Atzala. Uh-huh. And she called a social worker. Her name was Tamar, and Tamar called me to ask me what is the phone number of the children. And then the social worker was with me, uh, with the children online for uh, like 11 hours. 11 hours? Yeah, she was helping them and helping us. Wow. And we had like an agreement, me and the social worker. Her name was Tamar, like a, a silent one. I told her, I'm on the rescue and you're, on, you're gonna take care of the kids because I couldn't talk to them all the time. I couldn't do both. It was too much. Of course. I had to, you know, so everybody had the job. So it was very good for me that she came because she could, I was afraid that they'll go crazy because they were la- inside of the closet and the Smadal's body was in front of the closet. So I thought, how much, how much can a kid hold? I was so, so afraid for their, yeah, well for them. Yeah, for, yeah. That, yeah. So, so when Tamar came, came to and she was in the picture you know she she really helped that she spoke to them and i could do the rescue 
So it took 14 hours. 14 hours they're in the closet until... 14 hours they didn't eat. They didn't go to bathroom for 14 hours. They were hiding because there were terrorists all in the house all the time, knocking on the door, telling them, open the door, the army is here, the army is here, and they did not open the door. So it took 14 hours that uh, four volunteers, uh, Israel is an amazing country, went inside of the kibbutz and rescued them. Wow. took 14 hours. Uh, all the other members of the family were 30 hours inside of the shelter wow. with terrorists all brutally around. breaking the house, burning. Uh, terrible things happened in the kibbutz that day. Slaughtering. It was a was terrible but the kids were saved so it's nine o'clock at night i could breathe for the first time wow. yeah and then we we didn't know we didn't know Guli, abigail she was we didn't know she was a hostage because the last thing the children saw that she ran to the heart to the ends of her father and then the terrorist shot, shot her the, the father, father and he fell on her that was the last thing Michael Amalia, and Amalia saw be, before they ran back home. So they thought she was killed, but she was not. She's such a strong little girl, and she's so intelligent. And she, she stood up, and she ran to the to house of the neighbors, and they live quite far away. It's like it's a five-minute run for a three-year-old. She ran to the house of her best friend from the kindergarten, Uriah. They're always best friends. I think she ran because of him. We cannot ask her. Why did you go that day to that house? We cannot ask her, but we know he was her best friend. So she ran. She knocked on the door. That is, I take you back to 6.30 in the mm -hmm. morning because mm -hmm. Madame yeah. and Roy were killed at 6.30 in the morning. So she ran to the house of the Brodich family. The father opened the door. He saw Abigail full of blood and he understood something really bad happened to Ruin's Madar. So he went to take a weapon to defend the kibbutz. And then he was shot. He was not killed, but he was severely shot, injured. He could not go back home. He was lying down there. But at 11.30 in the morning, the Hamas terrorists came inside the Brodich family house and kidnapped his wife, Agar, and her three little children and Abigail to Gaza. We didn't know that, I think, for three days. For three days. We didn't so you thought, you thought she was We thought she, she was, was killed. Yeah, she was murdered. And we were full of grief and mourning. It was horrible. But then they found her pacifier, pink pacifier near the fence. And then one of the neighbors said, I saw the terrorists taking Hagar's car with Guli inside to Gaza. And then the father... Uh, Avichai who was injured mm -hmm. he said from the hospital but she came to us she was not killed and then we started to understand that maybe she's in Gaza it took us three days but one week that the army will approve the girl is a hostage she's orphan alone in the hands of Hamas or uh, ISIS and that's how the real nightmare starts that you have a little girl that was a hostage. I think everyone that is a hostage there is like a nightmare. So it was very, very hard. And um, I felt I have to support the family. I have to be strong because there are my two children, there are Smadal's children, and there are more children of the family, and everybody now needs someone to, to support them. So I think I got a lot of strength from the children to take care of them, to see that they're eating, that they're sleeping, that they're playing. And children are always always want to play. doesn't matter what happens, they always want to play. For the first time we saw Michael and Amalia after they were rescued, Michael did not speak anything. He, don't, he did not speak. And my sons just took him to play soccer. And it was so, it was like a surrealistic moment because this kid is coming, I don't know what, what was going in his mind, but the minute my, my son told him, let's play soccer, football, and he said yes, and they were playing. But Amalia did not stop telling the story, and she was telling it in a repeat over and over. And I was like, I stood next to her, and I didn't leave her for two reasons. 
reason number one is because she needed somebody to be with her. And I, I wanted to be that person that she'll know, she'll know she's not alone. But the second reason is it was the only evidence of the family. It was the last evidence of the family because Michal is not talking. And she's repeating the story very precise. With details? Yes, with details. And you know... I had to hear it because I needed, it's like the last uh, edut. Yeah, testimony. The last, the the last, last testimony. testimony of the family. And maybe she will not remember that. But I have to remember it for her, for her future. And you know, I'm a homeopath. So all, all my life with my children, I used to protect them. You cannot eat this, you cannot eat that, you cannot watch this and watch that. Not just, it's too bad, you cannot have TikTok. And then... They hear, you hear like a murder story inside of the family. Like you don't have control of anything. I said, oh no. I'm like, I can see the trauma like in front of me mm-hmm. happening. And it was very hard. But um, I think uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of good things happened because of the children. That I could be there for them. It gave me really a lot of strength. And uh, that they can see that their mother is doing things for them or doing things for Michal and Amalia. And if they need clothes, if they need an iPad, if they need someone to play with them or something to, someone to be when they cry or just to be there. So it was so important for me. <sighs> you know, the Instagram, all the, all the um, uh, social networks, all the social media was like a war zone in Israel. Mm-hmm. So I decided to make my Instagram like a, a place of peace. So I started to follow animals, <laughs> bears, whales, dolphins, just to put it on my story that I can just watch and uh, relax. Yeah. And Positive then a lot things. of people, yeah. a lot of people came because it was so <laughs> relaxing. So a lot of people came and we were following together manta ray, kangaroos, <laughs> you know, uh, cats playing the piano. So it helped me that time. It took uh, two weeks until we could bury Royens Madar, because there was such a war inside of the kibbutz, we could not rescue the bodies for bury. So it took two weeks. Which is very, very unusual in, in, in the Jewish world, because yeah. you, you bury you right. Bury right away, the yeah. same day. Yeah. yeah, so it took two weeks. Wow. And, um, and then we had uh, one week of Shiva. I don't know how... Yeah, the could. morning, the week of mourning. Yeah, week for, of mourning. Mm-hmm. And after three, three weeks... Uh, one of the uncles of the family came and told me, listen, Ella, I have a new mission for you. I said, oh, oh, oh no, what did he want from me? You have to represent the family in the hostage center in Tel Aviv because there are so many hostages and Guli is a hostage now and we don't know anything about what is going on. The country was in a chaos. They didn't know, nobody spoke to us. And I told them, I don't want to go there. Everybody, I don't want to sit there. What are we going to do there? Everybody's going to cry together and hold pictures. I don't want to, I want to be with the children and with the family. I don't want to go there. It was too much. If I would go to the hostage center, it's like to recognize that Guli is really in Gaza. And I didn't want to go there. Mm-hmm. But he asked me to, and I could not say no. And after three weeks, from the 7th of October, I reached the hostage center for the first time. I think I almost fainted when I reached there. It was so hard for me. I didn't want to be there. But I discovered a place, an amazing place. Everybody was so full of optimistic, uh, so optimistic and so full of wanting to help. Everybody wanted to help me and to hear if I'm doing okay. And did I eat? Nobody asked me for three weeks if I ate or slept because I, I was busy with You were the caregiver. Yeah. Nobody so they cared asked about you. Me, yeah. Did you eat? Are you okay? Do you need a psychologist? We can organize it for you. Do you need anything? And and then we found out that the families we do not uh, we do not um, deserve anything from the government. Mm-hmm. We do not get we do not get anything. No money. No social care. Nothing. Um, so it was really like everybody was overwhelmed because of that at the hostage center. We, so the hostage center tried to help everybody. Like there was, uh, they always asking, "What do you need? Do you yeah, need amazing. any any, ty- any kind of help?" Yeah. So I I helped 
whenever I could. I started to work there, like to volunteer there. So I started to split to my house, to the orphans, to 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 hostage center. I started to do a lot of things. One thing I could not do, I could not interview to the to the press. Smadal, my sister-in-law, she worked at the secret service. Oh, really? It was a big secret that day, and we were terrified that Sinuar will find out Smadal was in the secret service and her daughter, Guli, is in Gaza. We, we were terrified, so we were not speaking anywhere. Um, and every time people was, was speaking about her, we asked them not to. They not, didn't listen to us, but mm. all their social media was full of it. But it was a lot, a lot of work to try to... to, to Keep it kind of undercover. Yeah, thing. it was very, very um, risky for her. Very, because Sinwar, uh, he was on the social media all the time. They told us he's looking, as he's looking, and everybody that looks too, you know, deep, he can find, and he'll know. So it was very dangerous for Guli that we will talk. So only when she came back, it was the first time I spoke on the news. And, the and she so so Guli was in. Uh, I mean, she was kidnapped and she stayed in, in, as a hostage for... 51 days. 51 days. 51 days with Hagar Brodach, wow. the woman so, she so was kidnapped. So with a neighbor. Kidnapped. Yeah, she was with the, the neighbor. The parent of her best friend from kindergarten. Yeah, she, she was with her and with the three children. Wow. Uh, it was not easy. The, it was very hard for them. I heard Hagar and what she spoke and what she, she said. She, it was very hard for them. I mean, they went through a hell of a time. Eh, a hell of a time, sorry. A, yeah, yeah, through hell. I they mean, went really, through hell. Really, really, yeah. They went through hell. Unimaginable. Yeah. And so, so Hagar, Hagar, she, she cares for her three children. And Guli. And Guli in, in captivity in those yeah. conditions. Yeah. Wow. It was very hard for her. It took her a long time to recover. I can only imagine. Yeah. I can only imagine. And so... You have become very active with, yeah. with uh, the hostages and just caring for people and, and, and so on since that time. Yeah, I mean, I told the hostage center, all the families, that's what I was afraid of, that I'm going to know all the families and then every time something bad happens, I'll be sad because now they're like my family. That's mm -hmm. why I didn't want to go there. But now I think it was mo one of the most amazing things I could ever do. I'm so grateful for this uncle to send me there. I didn't want to. I'm so grateful for him. Um, I told the families when, you know, there was, uh, when they released a few hostages in November, I told them, listen, it doesn't matter. When Guli comes back, I will never leave you until everyone comes back. I promise. And the night she came back, they were writing and everybody was so happy for me. It was so hard because they loved ones did not come back. And Shelly, one of my best friends, her son Omer was not back. And uh, Avivit Yablonka, her yeah. brother Hanan, he was killed there. Yeah, it was like a, a yeah. confirmed that and he died. she's such a good friend. And I have such good friends there, like my family. You see, nobody can understand you like people that are from the Your hostage position. families. Yeah. We understand each other. We don't have to say anything. We can just look at each other. We know what we're going through. So when Guli came back that night, it was like an amazing night. I was, I was crying and I was laughing. And she came back in a helicopter. And I remember I was speaking to the helicopter. I was shouting to her to come back please come back to me and they were writing writing me on the phone on the whatsapp we're so happy Eli. It's such a happy day and it was happy for me and sad for them and mm -hmm. i promised them i will never leave you give me one week to recover right. and i'm back and i took one week to be with a family and i went back to the hostage center and since then i do everything for them i volunteer Uh, with um, lectures, with uh, children and teenagers and uh, high schools that come to to the square, and we we guide them on the square. We can yeah, the guides. We, yeah, we huh? guide them there. Uh -huh. yeah. Groups from abroad that come to Israel, I meet them and I speak to them. 
You lead them in a tour. I yeah, mean, lead them in them. a tour. I do a lot of diplomacy with uh, with all the diplomats that come to Israel or I go abroad. Yeah, you just came back. I just right? came back from France. Yeah, tell uh, us a little bit about that. If, well, what, whatever you can sure, say. Sure, I was invited by the general attorney of the U.S. They had the U.S. general attorney. Yeah, the wow. U.S. general attorney alliance. Um, they invited me to France to Normandy because it was 80 oh, yeah, years yeah, to that's right, the day, yeah. to to Normandy, and they had a conference there, and they wanted to. They had a conference, I think, for a week, but they wanted one day to hear about the crimes against humanity of the 7th of October and to hear about the hostage, hostages and to hear what the people of Israel went through. So they invited me because I have good English mm -hmm. and I can speak. And uh, they knew I give lectures. So uh, it was very powerful, very meaningful. And there are a few pe uh, people there that are not pro-Israel so, but after they heard me and the other lady that came with me, Effie, she is the sister of Ohadi Alomi, is also a hostage. Oh, yeah. He's a father, he has children, he's a hostage. He's severely injured in Gaza. After they heard us, they cried and they said they're sorry. Wow, and they came to speak so to amazing. us. And they stayed to hear everything. And it was amazing because once you speak to the heart, You just speak to the people. It doesn't matter what do you believe in. It doesn't matter what is your gender. It doesn't matter anything. You're just human. And you just speak to the heart and people listen to you because you listen to them. So it was very meaningful and very powerful. We were, had a lot of interviews to the French uh, newspapers that are also not pro-Israel. It was hard. Which is amazing to hear. I mean, you know, one of the things that I think is shocking to, to everybody in Israel and probably a lot of people elsewhere is how quickly the tables have turned. I mean, from October 7th, like two weeks later, Israel was the villain. I mean, we I were think the, in October 8th, yeah, Israel. Yeah, almost right away, right? Almost right away. And uh, that's what I told them also in the conference. I told them... Well, it's very strange that people are, are shouting from the river to the sea, but they don't know which river and which sea. Right. They're just saying that because they saw it on the TikTok. Right. And Israel, and they say, yes, but Israel uh, went inside of Gaza and they did a genocide. And, but I told them that Israel went into Gaza one, three, three uh, weeks or one month after October 7th. Everything started on October 8th. Everything started oh, yeah. before. Right. So they understood. And, and you know, as, you, as, as we said earlier, there's still 115 hostages in yeah. Gaza. We hope that most of them are living. You know the families. I know the families. How do, how do they keep on living? How do they do that? What, they keep on hope. They keep on hope. They hold the hope like strong. They cannot lose the hope or the optimism, because if they will, they will... Wither away, they die. They will yeah. not be here. Yeah. They hold, I see them holding it. Sometimes I don't have any hope anymore because I see what's going on. There is no deal. Yeah. And, uh, and they're still hoping. And every time I'll ask them, how are you doing? And they said, soon. They're soon going to come back. It's just an amount of time. Just a little more. Just a little, you have to hold. Just let's hold for today, Not one hour more. That's how they're doing it. They're very, very, very strong. And it's amazing uh, to hear because I think I think the the but hostages. It's horrible is, for them. It's horrible. They like imagine. sometimes I see them and I see I see that what are they going through. I went through that for 51 days. I felt it's like 10 years, and they're going through the more than 300 days that their children or in the tunnels of Hamas, and they're abused severely, and they're tortured. And I don't want to tell you what they're going through. I, I know a little bit, but it's horrible. It's, it's, you say crimes against humanity, it's more than that. And they just have to come back. Yeah, men. Yes. Men. And, um, yeah, I mean, I think... Uh, 
the fact that we still have so many hostages is uh, I, I don't think I exaggerate when I say it's a it's a wound on the heart of of every Israeli and as you say really anyone that cares about about life not, I mean not just in Israel we have many many friends around the world that deeply care because this is just uh, because they're shocked yeah it's because it a, happened here if it happened here it can happen anywhere absolutely and so it's so dangerous. It's so dangerous. And you know, um, I, it's very encouraging for me to hear you speak about hope and how families hold on to hope. I think that's a very, very powerful... Um, But not only hope. Uh -huh. Doing. For me, it yes. was very healing to do things, to be active. Even to come here and speak to you, it's healing for me. Because I can tell my story and you're listening to me. And maybe more people oh, yeah. can people hear my listen. story and I don't feel like so alone like I felt on October 7th. So I feel every time I tell my story, I get a little bit, a little part of my heart heals. So it's important for me. And it's very important to be active for me and to do things and to do good things. And, it, you know, so I tell it. People in Israel do every every day wake up and think about one little good thing you can do for the hostages. And mm -hmm. if not to the hostages, for your family. Or to, to put water for the cats downstairs. Or just do good things. That's all. That's all you can do because you don't have control about anything. So that's, that's my... Two cents. Uh, and it's just, uh, it's been uh, really a privilege to to listen. And uh, please know that us and many, many of our of the people that are listening and watching uh, deeply care, deeply care and, and sincerely want to uh, stand with with you and your family and the other uh, families. And there's still so much suffering in our in our land. So yeah. and just to say to all of our friends, if you would like to invite Ela and hear her lecture. There's many, many more details we were not able to cover. Please contact us and we'll pass it on and uh, you can talk directly to Ayla about her coming and lecturing uh, w with you. Can I pray sure. shortly? <laughs> sure. Yeah, and I invite all of us to, uh, to pray together and remember, um, we just heard, we were privileged to hear just a little, a little bit of, of uh, a very, very moving story and that's taking place in our midst right now. So uh, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we just uh, want to bring our hearts to you and we are feeling such a mix of uh, pain and uh, many different thoughts, but, but also hope. And so we just want to pray for uh, the hostages to come back. We pray that you will intervene and you will Uh, move the hearts that need to be moved so that all the hostages will come back, families unite, and um, healing truly begin uh, for the families, for the hostages, and for our nation. Lord, we just want to bring that to you, before you, in Yeshua's name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Ella. Thank you so much Ella, for inviting me and hearing my story.